This is Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. It's powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Hey entrepreneurs, my name is Felix and I'm the host of the Shopify Masters podcast. Each week we put out podcast interviews with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs or experts to give you inspiration, motivation, and actionable tips to increase your traffic and sales so your store can generate the sales you need to live the life you want. In the last episode, John and Rana Lustian from Edible.com explained how they went from casting wide nets to focusing on highly qualified traffic. On today's episode, you'll learn from an entrepreneur that has over 20,000 products, but only lists a handful of them on their own site. In this episode, you'll learn why you might need a demo program to sell in expensive products, how to decide what to sell where when you have multiple sales channels, and how to transition from learning to execution. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Cayley from WorldwideCyclery.com. That's W-O-R-L. D-W-I-D-E-C-Y-C-L-E-R-Y.com. Worldwide Cyclery is an epic bicycle shop on a mission to redefine what a bike shop can be online or in-store, stocking all the good stuff. It was started in 2011 and based on Newberry Park, California. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, thanks, Felix. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. So, um, bike shop. So you have one online, you have, a, 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 I guess, a retail store as well. Tell us a, m- a little more about it. Like, what is uh, What are some of the, the popular products that you sell uh, online or in-store? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I, I started the business in January 2011, and in the bike shop world, pretty much to even be a player in the game, it's kind of an industry requirement to actually have a retail store. That's just kind of how it works in the industry. So unfortunately, it's not one of those things where you can just get an account and start selling stuff online. It's it's one of those things where there's a little bit of a barrier to entry and you do need a retail store to kind of just be a player. So yeah, I launched the store in, in early 2011 and it was just a little small retail shop. And my focus with it always was to, to focus on the high end. So my background, I rode and raced bikes my whole life and you know, absolutely loved it, really passionate about building bikes and the different types of bikes there are and, and that sort of stuff. And I really liked the high-end stuff because that was what I was into as a racer and, and being into the industry for so long. So yeah, I was 21 when I started it. We The original building was 1,000 square feet, so a tiny little bit of you know retail store shop up the front. And then uh, we had sort of some office space and a little shipping table, and it was a kind of a little hole-in-the-wall operation at that point when we started it. And, uh, it, it's evolved quite a bit from there. You know, now, now we're in about a 5,000 square foot building, uh, retail stores in the front, the office space is in the middle and, you know, all the warehouse and, you know, mechanic work takes place in the back. So, so that's, what's going on there. Our, our kind of niche we're we're really, you know, not entirely niched into the high end segment of the mountain bike world, but that's where we predominantly play and where most of our customers go. We we do try and cater a little bit to the road side of things and, you know, the commuter style cycling bikes as well. But we're, you know, our, our, uh, main focus and what we're, what we're best at core competency, you could say would, would be the, the higher end mountain bike scene. So, um, bicycles get expensive people that are super into them. It's a pretty common thing to have a bike that's, you know, $5,000 plus, um, so for us, it's, you know, 7,000 to 12,000 is kind of the average bike that, that we build and sell here. And, uh, yeah, we, we do a good bit of business in the retail store, but it's predominantly online. We're about 85% online is what we do. And, and that's really the main focus, you know, the retail store, like I said, it's kind of an industry requirement. So that's why we, uh, you know, have a retail store. If we had the choice, we, we probably still would. I mean, it, it does help to build legitimacy and, and give customers sort of that ability to, you know, buy stuff online, pick it up in the store. And it's also nice. Some of the products we sell, you know, complete bikes, uh, people can come in here, test ride them, you know, touch, see, feel it, that type of thing, which is, which is nice when you're selling a, a really high price point product. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the rundown of the shop. Mm. So you mentioned that you started this when you were 21, a thousand square foot, um, retail store, much bigger now, but even back then a thousand square feet for someone that's 21, it sounds like a pretty big, uh, investment. It's going to cost some money. Did you take on any investments early on? Like how did you fund the very early days of getting a, a, a retail store off the ground, especially that. And then on top of that, the inventory. Yeah. So, so what I did was, uh, luckily I had, you know, big shout out to my parents. They're super supportive of me. You know, at, at that point, 
I basically, you know, asked for a twenty thousand dollar loan from my mom, and she gave it to me at a ten percent simple interest rate. So she made out on that one a good bit, <laughs> um, paid her back within the first year, and then my my dad, being the supportive guy that he is, he helped me lease the building. So we utilized his credit. He was the the uh, part owner in the company, um, basically just for credit reasons, and and helped me, we, you know, co-sign on the the lease of the building. So, so that's how I did it. I used the twenty thousand dollars to fund the first little bit of inventory and put some stuff inside of the building, and then uh, you know utilize my dad's credit to uh, to be able to lease that building. And then from there, I was also working a second job. So I was working a job, and and that was like the all time backup plan, right? It was like, okay, if we we don't make enough profit to actually pay the rent on this place, I at least have a a part time job so I can fund it that way. So, I mean, that's I guess kind of the definition of bootstrapping, right? I would. Uh, I would typically wake up at 5 a.m. and and get to the shop, you know, 5:30 or so, six o'clock in the morning, and I would just bust out everything I could until about two o'clock. Then I would uh, take off. I'd work another job, two to seven. I'd do that. Then I'd go back to my shop and I would work there from about seven to nine p.m. And then I would try and get to bed by ten. And and I did that for you know a solid two years, just really hustling and and not sleeping very much. And, you know, I had a very different life as a 21 year old kid. All my friends were kind of interested in going out and partying and getting hammered every weekend. And I was just putting my head to the ground and and working, you know, 16 hours a day. So, um, luckily it's all, it's all paid off and it wasn't an epic failure, which, you know, could have happened, but it it worked out. And, uh, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I was able to pull that off. It was, it was hard work. And then uh, a lot of, you know, incredible support from my parents. Did you uh, close the store down then while you're working a second job, like during the day, or did you have someone step in and and look over the store while you're out? I did. So so in the early days when it was just me, um, because it was such a tiny podunk retail store, nobody was really coming there anyway. Um, so we were able to, you know, I, I would just lock the door and no one really showed up, so it didn't matter. Um, the main focus from the beginning of the shop was always to be predominantly online. You know, I... I had been in the industry for a while. I saw that that's the way consumers were going was buying a lot of these products online. So, so seeing that trend, you know, really made me think like, you know, like the typical local bike shop, it's just an evolution. The higher end segment of it, a lot of that stuff wasn't stocked in stores. So you had to go to the bike shop and special order the product anyway. And then they would order it from their supplier or manufacturer. And then you would end up having to come back a few days later and pick up the product. So a lot of the guys that were into the higher end stuff, they already knew it wasn't in the store. Like they just knew it wasn't there. So they were buying this stuff online. So that's kind of, you know, the higher end market was what pushed a lot of the products online to begin with just because of consumer demand. So so because of that, you know, that was the main focus and I, and I knew that's the direction I wanted to go. So from the beginning, you know, I didn't really advertise the retail store at all. I wasn't trying to drive foot traffic by any way, shape or form. Um, I was just really focused on uh, th- the lowest hanging fruit, which at that point was, you know, what do I know is a top selling product in the industry? What do I know is going to, you know, I'm gonna, something I'm going to be able to put on eBay and it be able to sell quickly and we can actually make a profit. So The initial idea was like, get the shop, you know, build it out, you know, have the distributor reps come by and say, okay, this, this, you know, barely passes, but it passes and you can have an account with us now as a distributor. And then once they gave the account to me, it was like, all right, now we just got to, you know, pick and choose the popular stuff and maybe bring one or two of them in store or maybe just see that, okay, they have 50. So I'll just post five of them on eBay and try and sell them. Um, so that was the, the quickest way to market really for me. So that's what I would do, you know, while I was there. And then, um, because it wasn't really driving much foot traffic, I would just leave and kind of just made the hours were the hours of the retail store were whenever I was there. And, and that's how it was for, um, for quite some time. You know, I had a friend helping me early on that I would try to get to be there, you know, help me out. And he ended up unfortunately not working out after about eight or nine months. He just, you know, he was, great guy, still friends with him, loved him to death, but he wasn't quite uh, ambitious about business like I was at the time and a little more concerned with doing the usual 21 year old kid stuff. So because of that, you know, he, uh, he, we, we traded him out eventually for another friend of mine who came on, who came in about, I think after about uh, a year and a half of the business being open and he's still with the company today. And, you know, he was a huge help, but for that first year it was, it was pretty much just me running the show and, uh, 
you know, the store hours were whenever I was there. <laughs> so you mentioned that the main focus from the beginning was always to focus on online, predominantly online. What made you uh, say earlier on that you must have a retail store in this industry? Yeah, so it's just kind of one of those, um, I'm sure there's some other retail industries that are like that, right? You know, because I think one of our main differences compared to some of the other ones I've heard on your podcast before, a lot of the people you interview are uh, manufacturing their own products. So we're not Mm -hmm. doing that. We're just uh, retailing a lot of higher end brands. And a lot of those brands are, you know, selling directly to retailers, which would be bike shops, or they're selling directly to distributors, which then sell to bike shops. And um, the way that model works um, in the bike industry, I'm sure it's probably like that in a few others, but basically they, they don't want to sell to Joe Schmo in his garage, you know, because if they did that, then he has no overhead. He doesn't have any technical knowledge of the product. And then he just tosses it up on the internet for a super low price. And then a customer has a bad experience with it because you, you know, he sold it incorrectly or wasn't able to educate them on how to install the thing. Um, cause there's a lot of technicalities to the products we sell. So, so because of that, the industry sort of demands, they say like, Hey, you know, and this is kind of like the, the manufacturers and distributors decided this together, um, you know, probably before I was around and, and they said, you know, in order to sell, in order to give an account and sell to these people at wholesale costs, they need to have a real retail store. They need to have, you know, ed- education on the product. They need to have a place to actually work on the products and a bike stand in there. They need to have, you know, some other brands that they're carrying, things like that. So it's really just a total industry requirement because, you know, these distributors don't want to sell to any old random person. They want to sell to a genuine bike shop. Um, and, and luckily, that's kind of the only requirement. It's not like they're saying, you know, A, you have to have a bike shop and B, you have to spend 10 grand with us. Like most of them are pretty lenient on that. They're just like, A, you have to have a bike shop and now you can kind of just pick and choose what you want to buy. And um, they're pretty lenient on, on how much you purchase from them initially. Um, so yeah, that's that's how that worked and why we decided to mm. start the retail store off the bat. Yeah, the retail store is almost like a proxy for to determine if someone's serious about the business or serious about the brands they're repping or not. And you you mentioned that the the, the representatives from these uh, these brands came out to check out your store in person. Like, what were they looking for? Yeah, so so be you know because it's it's pretty well patrolled like that. You know, you've got the outside sales reps from the brands that you want to carry and the distributors you want to work with. And they'll actually, you know, come to your retail store. I mean, they want to see it. They, they want proof that you've got a real bike shop, that you've got tools there, that, you know, you've got square footage and that it's the real deal. And it's, and it's not just a, you know, you didn't just rent your friend's garage type of thing. So, so they just kind of come out and want to, you know, put a face to the name and meet you and, and check out your operation and, and just make sure that you're legitimate, which is good because, you know, because of that, all, all of that uh, due diligence that they do on the retailers, you, you usually end up with you know people who have skin in the game, people who do actually know the product and want to invest in selling those brands and and being a, a proper retailer for all of those you know higher end brands. So it, it's good. I think it's good that the industry puts that mm-hmm. barrier to entry in there. And once you have success like you do today, and you have a track record with these brands, do you still need to keep a, a retail store open? You know, um, we we do. There, there's a couple players in the industry that that don't have retail stores, but it, they're monstrous. They're uh, you know fifty million dollar plus companies. So, so those guys have got away with not doing it. But um, you know we do, and and some of the other bigger guys as well. They could probably get away with not having it, but they kind of want to um, because of the products that you know that we sell and our competitors sell. The retail store definitely helps. You know, not only does it kind of bring legitimacy to you as a retailer, but it does give the customer the opportunity to purchase online, pick up in store, or come and actually test the product at your store, come and look at it in store and, you know, chat about it. So kind of the future of the, you know, the way I see it, at least in our industry, the future of, uh, you know, a top tier retailer in the bicycle industry is, is going to be very omni-channel. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's something obviously Shopify promotes all the time is being omni-channel and it's so true in the bicycle world. You know, retail storefront is a really helpful thing. Um, but you also have to mix that with a great e-commerce presence on your own website and on all third party marketplaces. So that's the way I see a, you know, top end retailer, playing the game in the future and in the way that, you know, we're doing it now. And I think a, a lot of other retailers are kind of tagging along and starting to evolve that way. You know, you've got the old school guys who are just running the retail store 
who are trying to dabble and get into the e-commerce side of things, and, and you've got the guys who are playing the e-commerce game really well, but also see the value in, in doing both and having the retail store as well. Yeah, it's, it's not just uh, trust from the manufacturers, the brands that you are representing, but then it, you know all the time you'll, you'll see sites that if they have an email address, if they have a phone number, uh, display very clearly on their site. It just adds these kind of little trust factors in it because you recognize that, okay, it's not just some fly, you know, by night kind of put up some website and try to scam people. There's actually, it's tied to a real person, tied to a real business. But then once you have a retail store, it's even a bigger trust factor because this is a place that you can actually go in person, see the products, see the people that work behind it. So I think, I think you're, you hit on something that, that, that kind of trust is, is, um, uh, there you bring so much trust by having a physical retail store, not just to the, to the brands that you're selling, but then also to, to the customers that are buying from you. Yeah, um, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I want to go back and touch on something that you mentioned earlier about the, uh, second, the part-time job that you had. One concern that I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs talk about, or maybe even warn other entrepreneurs about is that if you have a backup plan, you have a plan B you end up taking that plan B, that backup plan. Was that ever a concern for you? At any point during the you know the two years of that hustle, that grind of working these crazy hours, did you ever think like maybe I can just do something easier and go to work on a full time job essentially? Yeah, you know, there's obviously a lot of different theories about that. Like some people say, you know, be paranoid and have a backup plan, and then there's the other theory that's just like you know lay all your chips on the table and go for epic failure. Um, that way you won't fail. Like there's a lot of different theories on that. Um, I mean, it's probably different per person, but you know, for me it was, I I didn't want to take the easy path. I think that's a lot of a personality trait, right? And like the entrepreneurs you meet, the, the ones that actually have real success, like they earned it and, and they, they were very intentional about that success. Um, for me it was, yes, sure. I, I mean, I had a cush job. I was, you know, had a, I was working at an, another shop at the time that I was employed well and getting paid fair and, you know, it was a decent environment and, and you know, it was great. But it was also a dead-end job, which I think a lot of people can say they're in dead-end jobs to some extent. And and that's what I was in. And and I, I was so passionate about um, the products I was selling, about business, about entrepreneurship, about doing my own thing. And I, not only because like one, I like, you know, of course I said, you know, I want to make a little bit more money and be able to, you know, enjoy a little bit nicer life lifestyle, but it was really, that was a minute part of it, you know, for me, for me, it was really just, it would seem to be, it would be so fun and such a challenge to, to build a business. And I was so passionate about creating something and, and just doing something cool. Like I, I just wanted to, I just personally inside at that point felt like, I'm not, I don't want to be average. I don't want to just be another person who has an average job. I wanted, I wanted to be that kind of person who did something a little bit unique and, and was an entrepreneur and, and had a company and was, had some success at it. And, and I cared about that. I cared about, um, and about striving for some greatness and, and not going for the average easy route. And, and I think, you know, from my personal experience, that's how it was because I, because I cared about doing something unique. Um, plan B like, yeah, it was nice to have in case, everything fell apart, but, you know, I really was hustling and cared and had serious intention towards making the business a success because that's just what I wanted. And and I wanted it bad and I was ambitious for it and I went for it. So the plan B was just there, um, as sort of a safety net, but, uh, it was definitely no way, shape or form a consideration of me going back to it, <laughs> especially, and and some pressure gets involved there too, right? You know, I signed a, a one year lease on the building, so there's some pressure there, you know. And um, there, I obviously didn't want to fall back and take Plan B and then have to pay for the building. And um, so I don't know. I, I think that's kind of a boils down to who you are internally. I think I think having a Plan B is good. I, I think that's smart. I like the uh, you know, there's some business adage, and I can't remember which business book it is, but it's you know, only the paranoid survive. And uh, it's just talking about being cautious with things, and and I think that's a smart route personally. But um, you know, everyone's different. Putting all the chips on the table might work for someone. For me, I liked having that plan B and having that second job and um, having it as a backup plan to just be safe. But at the end of the day, 
I knew what I wanted and I was going to work super hard to, to make it work. And I knew it was going to be better than plan B once it, once it came to fruition. Mm. So one of the other things that you mentioned that you wanted to get to do from the get go was to focus on the high end. You wanted to have the high end products and because that was what you're interested in, uh, from a business standpoint though, was there also any, uh, I guess, was there also a business aspect of that to focus on the high end rather than, you know, I guess the low end or, or the, the mid tier? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the the bicycle world, once you get into it, it's it's very complex. I mean, you have everything from your your $100 bikes you see at mass merchant retailers like Walmart and Toys R Us and things like that. And then you have your, you know, step above your $300, $500 bikes that you predominantly see on sales floors at your typical local independent bike dealer. And that local independent bike dealer might also have some higher end products there, you know, some two thousand, three thousand dollar bicycles. And um, for me, I, you know, I came from racing bikes and got really into the industry. And and as you know, as you get more and more into something, you want to try the nicer stuff and the nicer stuff, and you save up your money to get the latest and greatest thing that was just released. And so, so that those were the products I knew the best, and they were obviously the, you know, it's it's more of a niche market. But, you know, obviously there's more money in selling a $7,000 bike than there is in selling three $300 bikes. So it was, to me, it was like one, there was, you know, the business sense made more sense because it was, you know, going for the high end. I I would rather, if I was going to own a car dealership, I'd rather sell Ferraris and Lamborghinis than sell Fiats, you know. And and so uh, I just kind of used that same thing in the bicycle world. I, I liked, knew, and care about the high end stuff. And there was, you know, obviously it was more lucrative. So, so that's where I went as opposed to targeting the, the lower end stuff. Cause you know, I think it's an element of passion too. Like I'm, I'm genuinely passionate to this day and always will be about high end top tier bicycles and, and all the components that go on them. And I love using them myself and I, uh, you know, I love selling them, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't really care for the cheap stuff. You know, I know there's a huge mass market of, uh, you know, selling beach cruisers for a hundred dollars, but I don't know, I can't get excited about that. And, you know, I, I'm not really, in the business just to just to make a buck i'm in it because i like high-end bikes and uh i'm passionate about that so you know there's a couple reasons why i went to the high-end side right off the bat Mm -hmm. and not everything on your site though is uh, thousands of dollars like you're saying some of these bikes some of these frames alone are two three four thousand dollars but you have of course accessories as well that are a lower price but this kind of gives you a full gamut of prices right from the lower from the not so expensive to the ones where you have to take a lot of time considering whether you want to buy it or not or do some more essentially price shopping even uh now does that affect your marketing like how do you decide to market or uh display the products when it's uh a a, let's say a six thousand six hundred dollar bike that I'm looking at right now versus like you know a thirty dollar pair of gloves. Yeah, it, it it's a tough line to cross because it's it's almost an identity thing, right? It's it's trying to say who are you? Are you just a high end retailer or are you any other bike shop? And and that's been something that that branding dilemma has been you know has been tough for us over the years because. We have access with all the distributors that we work with to to the gamut of cheaper stuff to the top tier stuff. Um, And we found over the years as well that some of this mid-range stuff actually sells really, really well. Um, So it's like, well, we don't want to just not sell that product because we like high-end bikes um, because then we're just leaving money on the table. But at the same time, we don't want to confuse our customers then make you may be thinking we're not the high end guys because we have this low end product on our site so and, and it still is to this day we we don't have it perfectly figured out um you know obviously the most most of our branding marketing and promotion all of that focuses on the high end stuff and you know when you hit the site the home page all you're going to see is the high end stuff but if you do your digging there's there's some cheaper stuff on there, whether it's accessories or it's even just components. You know, uh, like a suspension fork would be one of them. You know, we always have all the top end stuff on there, but cheaper suspension forks, which you know the higher end stuff would be around the thousand dollar price point. The cheaper stuff would be around the hundred and fifty dollar price point. Um, and you know, we have all of it on there. We've got the hundred and fifty dollar stuff on there and the thousand dollar stuff on there. So obviously, we're, we're targeting and. We try to really focus on what we consider A customers, which A customers are the people that ride $5,000 plus bikes. They're the people that buy the $1,000 suspension for. That's who we, we market to in our target demographic. Um, but 
we're still going to toss up these other items that we that we know can sell well, and especially on third party marketplaces, they sell well, and especially things like Google Shopping or even just organic traffic. You know, some of these products sell well, so so it still is a little bit of a a tough identity crisis for us, and and we're we're trying to you know do what we can to to brand ourselves the right way. But when you we have a big catalog, right? So we have a catalog of about twenty thousand SKUs. And in a lot of it, you know, we stock a lot of it in our warehouse here. A lot of it's stocked at our distributor that we just kind of do just in time inventory model with. So it sells on our site or on a third party marketplace. You know, we, we then order from our distributor, shows up the next day, we ship it out. So we do that with a lot of SKUs too. Um, so because of that big catalog, it is hard to say, you know, we're just this. Um, so it's, it's a tough one. Um, we're, we're still trying to figure it out entirely, but uh, I, I don't have a perfect answer. You know, I, I would you know, love to never sell any even mid-range stuff ever again. Um, but I think if we did that, we would, uh, we'd be leaving a lot of money on the table and, um, you know, cutting out a lot of revenue that, that we could be making just to kind of cater to a little bit broader of an audience and not go so niched. Mm. So now when you do have uh, a, a product, like let's say socks, for example, you're selling socks as well on here, which, uh, you know, can't get that expensive. So they're 15, maybe $20 at the most. And then you have these $6,000 bikes as well. Do you bother even marketing the, the accessories that are a lower price point or do you focus all on the high end, uh, highest price products? And then maybe they'll come to the site and stumble on something to add into their car while they're buying a much more expensive product. Yeah. So so we we definitely, when it comes to what we spend our time marketing and promoting, we definitely focus on the higher end stuff because that's what we care about selling the most. It's what we know the most about. It's what we know um, we can make the most money on, and, and you know, and it's what we know the the customers we want to attract buy that stuff. So, so that that's kind of our our take on that one. Um, but of course, you know, the guy who rides a seven thousand dollar bike, he also might want some cool like one brand we carry is sock guy and they have these like super hilarious uh you know bicycle industry jokes printed on socks you know that would totally appeal to him so it's a good upsell item um we're not going to advertise socks by any means but we're going to advertise other stuff and so we kind of have to pick and choose that way um and so the majority of our marketing efforts we're pushing the expensive stuff the other cheaper stuff you know that's just like if you're on there and you happen to see it, it might be a good upsell or you might stumble upon it and be like oh i could use some of those as well um but we focus on the stuff that uh the stuff that really that you know is it what we'd consider would sell to an a customer and then um you know all the other stuff is uh is, is on there if you stumble upon it and you know, I guess that's, uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that, that does. I mean, I was wondering if you do have such a wide range, if for listeners out there, they have such a wide range of uh, price products, should they focus on marketing and putting the dollars behind the, the kind of key products or should they kind of spread it out throughout all of their products? But it sounds like your case, you focus on what's most important to you guys, which is our, which are the high-end bikes. And then uh, if the traffic comes and, and decides to check out the other products and they buy, great. Um, but again, the focus has always been on the, the, the kind of key flagship products for you guys. Now, speaking of these uh, these $7,000 bikes, it's funny. Every time I write down this question I want to ask you, you keep on bumping up the price of these bikes to get even higher each time. So $7,000 bike now. So when people, do people actually buy these online? Like how, what's their, what's the, the sales fund for something like this? Are they coming onto the site and just buying it right away? Or is there a much longer process, I guess, compared to, to the more cheaper products that you sell on the site? Yeah. So, so to give you, you know, to kind of preface this question, to give you a bit of a breakdown of the categories that we sell. So, you know, it, it all starts with bikes. However, a complete bike or a frame that's something that, you know, the, the diehard enthusiast might buy twice a year. The typical enthusiast might buy once a year, and the average enthusiast might buy once every couple of years or once every three years. So it's not a high-velocity item. The What we predominantly move product-wise is components. So that's what people are buying all the time. You know, oh, a new handlebar came out, or oh, I, I crashed and scratched up you know, my handlebar, I want to buy this one or, you know, all these little different components that go on the bikes, the manufacturers are making them better. They're coming out with new colors or new styles or lighter weight ones or better performing ones. And, and that's the, velo- that's the velocity, that's the high volume stuff that is, makes up the majority of our revenue is components, whether it's suspension forks, rear shocks, you know, seats, handlebars, stems, 
Um, that's that's stuff that moves all the time. That's stuff that the enthusiasts, you know, the diehard enthusiasts, is constantly buying. You know, a lot of, a lot of our customers are, you know, more than once a month buying an upgrade for their bike, whether it's this part or the other part. Um, so so that's the majority of the the bulk of our our revenue is is from those components. So and that's just that's just a matter of volume, right? Because like I said, people just don't buy a frame or a complete bike as often. Mm-hmm. So because of that, um, we do put a lot more marketing dollars towards those components because we know they're high velocity and they sell more. They're also easier sales because like you'd imagine an expensive bicycle, um, there's a, there's a big sales cycle to that. There's, you know, if you're going to spend several thousand dollars on a bicycle, uh, you want to do your research. You want to, you want to learn about it. You want to, you know, watch YouTube videos on it. Um, you know, and, and some people do, depending on where you're at, as far as knowledge, some people will just never ridden a bike, never even seen it. They just trust the brand that makes it. And they look at the geometry and the specifications and they just buy it. You know, some people are like that. Uh, that's probably a small percentage of the market. The The majority of the percentage, they want to do a little bit more due diligence and and some of them want to actually ride the things before they buy it. And, and that's what that's where the retail store comes into play. So a lot of the bikes, you know, sitting on our showroom right now are, you know, probably the, the average price point of there is $7,000. And so we've got a demo bike program where you can show up in the shop. It's 95 bucks for 24 hours. Uh, you can actually take any of the bikes here out, ride the thing. We have a bunch of awesome local mountain bike trails that ride around the shop. You can actually ride the bike for an entire day or the whole weekend or whatever you want to do. And then the money you spend on the demo, so say you spent 95 bucks for a one-day demo, uh, that goes right towards your purchase of a bike or a frame. So when you're serious about it, you know it's no question, oh, 95 bucks, I can ride the thing before I spend seven grand on it. Um, people love that. And, and most people um, spending that kind of money really enjoy that, which is where the retail store comes into play and that revenue works good out of there. So people come in, they actually demo these things and, uh, you know, they might demo two or three in our own showroom. They might, you know, go to some other shops in, you know, a hundred mile radius and drive around and uh, demo some other bikes and test out a bunch of different brands and make a purchasing decision based off of that. So sometimes there is a pretty long sales cycle to the thing. Um, which is why bikes are just something that doesn't move super fast. Um, but components are something that people are more willing to just, oh, that's awesome, and look at the specs and look at it, and oh, I want it, and they just impulse buy it. Mm, so yeah, these long sales cycles, I, th- I think the concern that people have when they're entering an industry like this is how do they stay top of mind? How do they stay in the mix when people are going through these purchase decisions? Because the more time a customer has, the more opportunities they have to essentially bump into your competition, bump into alternatives. What do you guys do to make sure that you are in the mix then, that you are going to be considered amongst the competition when it's a longer sales cycle? Yeah. So so that one's pretty tough. I, and I think the the best thing that we've executed on to to stay top of mind in the consumer's mind is uh, really focusing on the stuff they buy often, right? Uh, the consumables, whether it's tires or grips or brake pads or just component upgrades. Um, so if we're selling that to them all the time, when it does when it does come that one time a year, twice a year when they're gonna buy a new bike or a new frame, they remember us because they've mm-hmm. had a good experience um, shopping with us before. And then, of course, content is huge. I mean, uh, generating content around the bikes that we sell is big. Generating content around the components that they're going to buy. And, um, you know, we do a lot with our blog, and, and that really drives a lot of organic traffic to our site. And and that's kind of how uh, – that's pretty much how we stay top of mind in that sense is putting out good content and, and trying to get as many of those um, small sales in between the big sales as we can. I like I like that that you're almost training the the customer to keep on returning to you to buy the the larger more expensive products because they're used to buying the the less expensive products. Um, so you know, speaking of the content that you create, the more expensive a product, the more education is required. Like you were saying earlier, people want to read reviews, watch YouTube videos, or in your case with the physical retail store, people want to come and actually try it out, go through these in person demos. Um, now for for the online portions, I think most of listeners are operating online only stores how do you approach the the content you create how do you know what kind of content or how do you decide what kind of content to, to create around your products yeah so i think you know when we make a decision of what kind of content we're going to create you know we have a little bit of a rule book that we we like to follow and 
you know, one of its, we always try to, you know, us being a retailer, we're always trying to uh, be kind of the first person to create content. I mean, that makes, that makes a huge difference is if you're the first, if, if something's going to get released and, you know, you have a relationship with the manufacturer and they say, hey, we're going to publicly release this new version of this product or brand new product entirely on this date and here's all the information about it. Um, create your content now and, and you can post that live on, you know, January 25th at 1201. Um, we'll do that, you know? And so if, if we know it's something, you know, it, it's knowing your industry, right? Like one being, being the first person to create content is, is always kind of the Holy grail because you know, that generally you get really favored in Google when you do that. And the, and it's just knowing the industry, you know, it's, it's, we know because, because we actually, you know, we're, we're the real deal. Everyone here rides bikes, including myself, and we're all really into it and, and uses this stuff every day. And, you know, we all look at all the industry news and media sites and, and we're just up to date on the stuff. We, we know the popular stuff. We know what's trendy. Um, we know what customers are looking at because it's the same stuff we look at, you know, and when manufacturers release a new product, we're, we're just as intrigued as, as anyone. And, um, you know, I think that's, what's cool about being in this industry is, you know, a lot of guys, all the guys that work here are passionate about it. And, um, it, it's even pretty funny to me sometimes, like someone will release a, a new crank set, which is, you know, nothing super exciting, but it is, if you're a diehard mountain biker and, uh, you know, we can promote content around it. We know it's an incredible product. We know it's going to sell well. So that's where we put time creating the content. And then, you know, the, the first batch of them show up here to go into inventory and everyone's like, Hey, these new, these race face next to sell cranks are here. Oh, really? And then like everyone gets up and like goes and looks at them, um, which is pretty funny. It just shows that, you know, we're passionate about it and we know about it. And, and when you, when you're passionate about the industry and you understand what's going on in the industry, um, you usually are going to have a good idea of what the consumer wants to see and, and what they're Googling. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned earlier about how you believe uh, the industry, and maybe that, I mean, definitely not exclusive just to your industry, uh, but omnichannel is the big, uh, I think, the future for, for marketing and sales for any industry. Now, how do you guys manage it? Because you have the retail store, you have the online store, and I think I heard you mention earlier about third party marketplaces. How do you manage all of that, uh, basically, all those, all those channels for you? Yeah, so so that boils down to, of course, being pretty darn or, organized makes a big difference there. But uh, there's a piece of software we use called Channel Advisor, and they're sort of a, a multi-channel inventory management piece of software. And, it, and it's pretty expensive stuff depending on the – it's kind of revenue-based and, and the amount of SKUs-based and things like that. Um, there's some competitors out to, the, to them as well that you know might be a better fit for – different particular situations but uh though yeah the one we use is called channel advisor and and that's kind of our, our inventory hub and from there um you know we have all we house all of our inventory data within channel advisor and and that's how we know what's in the retail store and how we can ring people up through that and it's how we then push that product data to ebay amazon jet and shopify so that's kind of the the biggest secret there is you know you definitely have to use quality software because if, if you're trying to do any type of omni-channel operation, even just two online channels, and you don't have a good quality piece of software that's helping you manage the inventory and and keep those inventory levels synced across all the channels, I mean, that'd be a, a total nightmare and would make it impossible. And um, I think part of the reason why, you know, we've had some pretty good success against our competitors is because we've done a better job at utilizing software and and making sure that our inventory levels are synced across the different channels and, and making sure they're posted properly and, and just managing that data is huge. So, you know, that, that's a that's a big piece to the omni-channel puzzle is just having a good piece of software to back you and up. You are selling in so many marketplaces and off, on the online store and the offline store. I'm sure that you don't have the same types of products are in the physical retail store as you do on your own store, as you do on the marketplaces. How do you decide what to to sell where? Yeah, so the way we kind of do that, um, you know, we, we try to keep our our website a little bit more niche to our target audience as much as we can, and, and we don't want to clutter it too much with products that we don't really think make sense to the visitors. We just want to kind of do our best to, to narrow down the, the, the product breadth that's actually on the website. And then if it's other random things, you know, like some of our distributors sell other, you know, 
kind of off the wall items. Like one of them also carries a little bit of camping gear or, uh, or stuff that's like a, a different type of cycling, like triathlons and stuff. There's a lot of specific tri gear and it's not really our core competency. So it's not really something that we'd want to get on our website, but you know, it might sell really well on, on Amazon or eBay. So we just kind of post it there. So we're kind of just pick and choosing. And a lot of that's brand based, right? So a lot of the brands we deal with, you know, this brand here, they just are in the high end mountain bike scene. So we know they're going on the website, this brand here, all they do is, you know, high end triathlon gear. So eh, probably not the best fit for the website, but we'll post some of that stuff to third party marketplaces. Can you say more about why you keep this the the products on the store niche and and have a I guess a more a narrow catalog? Yeah, so I mean, I, that kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about earlier about the identity of you as a retailer, and um, you know, of course, it's it's beneficial for the customer. Um, it, it's kind of tough, right? Because there's that thing like customers want a huge selection, and and that's one of the things you know you hear Jeff Bezos say, right? Whereas people go to Amazon because they have everything. Um, but if you want to compete with Amazon, yeah, put everything on your website. But if, if you're trying to go deep in your audience, um, then it, you don't want to have too much random stuff on there. You want to just focus on your target market. You think what's your ideal target customer and what do they want to see on your website? Put that on there. And, and what don't they want to see on your website? And what's something that you could put on your website that they would see and they'd be like, oh, I should totally buy that. Or something you could put on there and they'd be like, what the heck is that doing on there? You know, it just gets in their way. So that's why we, you know, kind of focus on on making sure we we niche down the product selection on the website. And and there's a ton of products on there, but, you know, there there's a lot less on there than there is on third-party marketplaces for us because of that reason, because we don't want to clutter it up with stuff that doesn't really make sense and fit with our brand as a retailer. Um, so on a third party marketplace, it doesn't really matter because it's, you know, when you buy on Amazon, you think you're buying on Amazon. It's, it's not really, you're not creating that like intimate connection with the consumer. Whereas mm-hmm. when they hit your website, they want to know who you are and they want to feel cool about that and, and feel good buying from you. And, um, and that's how you're going to create loyalty as well. So that's kind of why we niche down the website product spec. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that you also sell on on Jet, which is I think the first time I've heard anyone on on the podcast talk about selling on Jet. Tell us about that. What is that? What has that experience been like? Yeah, uh, man, I, I think I could do a a, <laughs> a whole other podcast on that topic because it's pretty funny. But Jet was interesting. I mean, the the reason we went on Jet was you know Channel Advisor had an, put together an integration with Jet and, and kind of just offered said, hey, you know, you, you're a Channel Advisor customer, you can list on Jet really easy and. And Jet initially was only accepting, I think they might even still do it. I think you can only sell on Jet if you use some type of inventory management software that has an API with Jet. Uh, you, it's not like eBay where you can just go on there and post things. There's like there's not a user interface in the back end to do that. It's, it's all done through an API. Um, that's how it was. I don't know if it's still like that, but I think it is. And um, So Channel Advisor kind of just offered it up. And, and we started, I think one of our competitors did it, and, and we started noticing that uh, sometimes we would Google something and we'd see a, a, a Google shopping result from Jet. And we're like, what the heck? And, you know, of course, it's it's one of our competitors on there. So like, well, we might as well go on there because, you know, it, it doesn't take any time and it didn't cost us anything to just post a bunch of products to Jet um, using a data feed. So, so we just sent the stuff to Jet. And uh, the interesting thing was when Jet was in their big, you know, guns of the guns of blazing customer acquisition strategy, they were just... You know, it didn't really matter what was on there. They were bidding on it for Google Shopping. So obviously nobody's going to Jet to buy mountain bike parts. Just not a chance. Um, however, if people are Googling something specific and we have it posted on Jet and Jet does the bid for it for Google Shopping, then we might actually end up selling it on Jet. So that's what we did. And it, and it worked. You know, stuff was selling on Jet. We had some pretty good success with it. And it was like, wow, this is interesting. I have no idea why people are buying this stuff on Jet, but we kind of did know because they're just obviously finding it through through Google Shopping because Jet is just doing these crazy bids on Google Shopping just to get customers to buy from Jet. Um, and so we thought, wow, that's interesting and it, it's cool and it went along for a while, and then all of a sudden it just tanked. And it's like, well, <laughs> kind of, we kind of, you know, never really trusted that it wouldn't do that, but it tanked because, uh, and you know, it's funny, it was. It was shortly before they were acquired by Walmart, and uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know the internal business intricacies of Jet, but 
I'm sure it had something to do with them, you know, backing off on their customer acquisition spend and and focusing elsewhere. And so now now Jet's a, a very dismal sales channel for us. Um, still sells some, but but pretty small. And and so it, w- it was an interesting ride with Jet and, and how they were just kind of doing Google shopping for anything you put on there. And um, sort of the more funny stuff is, you know, they had a some manufacturers have minimum advertised price policies where they say, you know, you, you cannot sell this for less than $100. That's our policy, period. Um, so we would send the data to Jet and we'd say, hey, Jet, post it at $100. Uh, and then we'd expect a, a 15% fee, just like Amazon. So we're expecting $85 back if that thing sells. So the product would sell, we would get our $85, but Jet would actually sell it for $95. So they were cutting into their own margin just to sell the thing below the minimum advertised price that was specified by the manufacturer Mm. so they they pissed off all these manufacturers in the bike industry um because we were we were telling them to post it at this price and they just wouldn't and they would just take it out of their own uh their own commission and so then all these manufacturers said well you can't sell on jet period and they told that to every single retailer um so i mean that was like probably five or six manufacturers came to that conclusion you cannot sell on jet we hate that marketplace um so 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 it was a wild ride it was crazy to see you know what jet did how they started i'm, I'm really interested in the business side of what happened there and um their massive acquisition from walmart was interesting and you know mark lore the, the guy who started it is obviously a pretty much an e-commerce god so it was it was pretty cool to to see what happened with the company and interesting to be a retailer on there see how it all went down yeah, that is interesting. Now, do you also do Google Shopping ads yourself directly too? Yeah, so Google Shopping is a is a big thing for us. That's that's one of our best things because for us, we have a lot of uh, long tail keyword stuff. When people are searching for the products that we sell, there's a lot of different, um, you know, model, sub model, sub sub model. So so there's a lot of specifications to the product for proper fitment and things like that. So Google Shopping really does well in that sense. So that's that's the biggest thing that we, you know, our biggest advertising spend goes to Google Shopping. Um, we don't manage it ourselves anymore. We we tried and, and struggled with it. Um, we outsource it to a uh, a firm now that's uh, called Conversion Path. They're I think they're out of Ohio. Super cool guys. Um, they've absolutely done a phenomenal job. One of the one of the guys who works here now. He came from a company called BTO Motocross, and pretty much same stuff we're doing, but with uh, with motocross uh, apparel and parts and things like that. And and so that company, they I think they were about a thirty million dollar a year, from what I remember, e commerce company in the motocross industry. And and he came from there, and that company had been using BTO had been using Conversion Path for for quite some time. So we had a good referral there, and. Um, we started using conversion path and, and they manage all of our Google shopping for us. And it's been phenomenal. I mean, shout out to those guys. They, they do an incredible job. And, uh, I, I don't, I don't have any idea how, uh, we could do that internally. I mean, I don't know if we could even financially do it internally for the same, you know, how good they're doing it for us. But yeah, so, so that's how that's managed. We, we don't actually do that ourselves. We kind of just oversee it and, you know, we use a firm to, conquer all the Google shopping complexities. Mm. Yeah, a lot of stores will start off trying to figure out paid ads themselves just because of budget issues. Then they just kind of have to learn about their industry a little bit more, learn more about their their customers. Uh, but you, you you started that way as well. Then you moved on to an agency. Tell us a little more about that process. Like, How do you work with an agency when it comes to having them run your essentially paid ads uh, program? How do you work with them to ensure that, that it is a success? Yeah, you know, it was really hard. And it really, I think, boils down to just who you're doing business with. I think there's a lot of marketing agencies out there um, that are really good at the smoke and mirror game, and they just don't actually perform. Um, and and we experienced some of that, you know, when it was interesting for our business, you know, the, the first couple of years in business, we really didn't do any advertising. The first two years in business, we didn't have a website, an e-commerce website yet. And we were just pushing stuff on predominantly eBay and through emails and on forums and, and hustling any way we could sell, any way we could move product. Um, you know, so, so our business grew pretty quickly just, just because of third party marketplaces and, and us being, you know, talented at utilizing data and getting it on different places. And then once we got, you know, Shopify set up and we got our e-commerce site dialed in, then it was like, okay, well now we need to drive traffic to the site and, um, it, it was tough. You know, we, we went through a, a couple agencies, I think two or three agencies that, and they, 
they were just awful. They just wasted money. They didn't know what they were doing. Some of them were better than others at pretending they knew what they were doing, and uh, they were very, I don't know, very vague with their reporting, and, and it, it was really hard. It was legitimately very challenging to find an agency that knew what they were doing, and, and we, of course, tried to try to do it internally as well. Um, you know, we, we tried to do our own data feed and do Google Shopping ourselves, and just we were wasting too much money and not not seeing that much return on it. And it, it was pretty tough. And then, uh, and that's why we, you know, when, when Michael here came over from BTO, he had that, um, he, he already knew conversion path was a great agency because BTO had been using them for years. And, and we kind of just lucked out, right? We, we learned about conversion path and, and finally gave, gave a swing and gave them a try and they just performed. They did a great job. They were extremely thorough with reporting they are extremely I think the the biggest tip I can give you is if you if you're looking to go with an agency the the biggest thing you'll notice is an agency usually that doesn't know what they're doing they're very focused on revenue look look at them we brought you all these sales an agency that knows what they're doing is very focused on profit and that's how conversion path is they're they're you know it, the I think the conversion path is actually founded by a guy who was a, a CFO of a company prior so they're very focused on profit, um, and they're very focused on giving every single report has a very good broke, you know, breakdown of your actual ROI, and it's and it's a net profit figure. So um, it works. You know, that's that's one of the biggest things. You know, a lot of agencies will just, I mean, trust me, you you can make a lot of money, you can lose a lot of money, and, and sell a lot of product. You know, using Google, um, actually selling a lot of product and not, you know eating all your net profit up doing it, that that's a lot more challenging. And so finding an agency that actually cares and, and will even mention the word net profit, you're probably in good hands. You know, most of them don't even say the word net profit. They just uh, talk about, <laughs> they talk about how much revenue they brought mm. in. And yeah. so, yeah, it was, it was really hard. It was challenging for us. And, and we lost a, a ton of money messing around with agencies that just didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, there's that joke that it's easy to make a million dollars if you spend ten million dollars, right? It's not. It's yeah. It's how, how do you get the return, the actual positive ROI on your ad spend? That's that's the most uh, important. That's the key, really, to to using uh, paid ads. So, can you give us an idea of the the growth or the success of the the business today? You know, since you started in 2011, it's been I guess six years now, six years in business. Um, give us an idea of how successful the business is today. Yeah, so so we're doing pretty good now. Uh, we we just closed 2016 at 5.3 million in revenue for that year. Um, that was a 35 percent year over year growth for from 2015. Um, as far as orders go, we we shipped about 34,000 orders in 2016. So uh, we've still got 100 percent positive feedback on on eBay and 99 percent on Amazon. So we're we're pretty proud of that. Um, we've got some great reviews on on Google and Yelp and Facebook, and uh, there's 10 people here, uh, and that's we're in about 5,000 square feet location now. Uh, we will be opening up a, another shop in Pennsylvania, all the way on the other side of the country, and uh, yeah, we've got some pretty audacious goals to to keep growing the thing. But um, yes, it's, it's gone great. You know, it's it's been a lot of hard work, but it's been incredibly fun learning and um and just pushing forward with it as i've as i've you know gone through the the process of growing the business but yeah it's uh it's decent size now and and we're continuing to grow it and and have a lot of fun with it most importantly and one thing you mentioned to me uh on, on over email was that working hard is not enough you also must learn hard can you say a little more about this what do you mean by that yeah you know i i think you know to me that's that's the most important thing that I think is overlooked. Um, there's so much, there's so much talk, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious if you get into the entrepreneurship world, you start reading books about entrepreneurship and business and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you're going to hear work hard until you, you can't stand to hear it anymore. It's just, it's just kind of a given these days. I mean, you got to work hard no matter what you're doing, whether you're trying to be an entrepreneur or you're trying to be successful in the corporate world, you got to work extremely hard. But the, the biggest game changer for me, um, was learning, you know, it's all knowledge. So I, I think, you know, a lot of what I credit the success of this business to is, is me just being, um, proactive about learning. It's, it's reading books. It's, uh, you know, and the, and the guys that work here too, you know, the, the team here doing everything I can to motivate them to read books. And, and it's incredible. I mean, you can learn so much 
And it's not just books. It, it's just quality content in general. You know, whether it's listening to great podcasts or watching YouTube videos or or going to meetups or, or other, you know, getting involved in other entrepreneurship organizations, things like that. Um, you just have to learn, you know, because if, if you really look at, you know, what's the difference between you and somebody, you know, say your vision for yourself, you know, everyone's got a different vision and goals, but say your vision is to be an entrepreneur who runs a, you know, $50 million annual revenue company, you know, the difference between you and that person is just knowledge. He just knows how that thing was built. He understands business better. Um, you know, he has so much more knowledge of the market in general and, and knowledge is just huge. And, and actually putting that knowledge to use is obviously uh, a key factor there, but I'm going to assume that's an assumption that people make. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I feel about that. I think that, you know, I've had epiphany after epiphany by, by reading books, by working with business coaches, by getting involved in entrepreneurship organizations and, and meeting brilliant people that were way ahead of my success level and knowledge level. And, and that's, that's just so important. And, uh, I, I think, you know, anyone listening to this podcast is, is doing a good thing. They're, they're listening and consuming good content that might help them grow their own e-commerce store. So, you know, working hard is a given, but learning hard is, is kind of the secret that I think a lot of people miss. Yeah, I think maybe a good question to close on is uh, how do you actually make sure that you use the stuff you learn? Because I think a lot of times uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs spend a lot of time learning, but then don't put into action and just kind of spend all their waste a lot of time. I guess not really wasted, but they spend way too much time on the learning phase and don't move into the execution phase. What's worked for you? For me, I think... uh, Habits are the biggest thing. You know, uh, you could read a book called The Power of Habit. It's uh, pretty, pretty insightful about that. But if you can just, if you can read a book and every time you, you know, you just have to be conscious about that. You have to be conscious about while you're reading this book and learning or, or listening to this podcast or watching YouTube video, you know, you have to be conscious that your goal is to find nuggets of knowledge that you can actually implement into your own life like that that's your goal so once you know your goal so that's your goal is to find those nuggets of knowledge you can implement into your own life that's your goal with this content now consume that content and every time you see oh that's interesting i could probably make this change and and actually implement that into my own life just execute on it write that down you know just just have that goal when you go into it when you first start consuming that content um, and once you have that goal, you'll find those nuggets that you can implement in your own life. And just the, the best way to do it is to set up a habit, right? You know, find something that you can set up a habit or, you know, if it's just a one-time thing, write it down and, and just, you know, use some willpower and, and execute on it. And I think that's a personality thing too. You know, obviously a lot of people read books and get all amped up and then don't do anything about it. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think that's a habit too. If, if you're once you get into a good habit of uh, consuming content and specifically looking for nuggets that you can pull out of there and and put into your own life, um, you get into a good habit of doing that and a good habit of actually finding those nuggets of knowledge and executing on them, and it just kind of snowballs from there. You know, it, it's all a habitual thing. You know, once you get into that habit of doing that, you you know, you, you continue to find them and more content you consume and it continues to make your life and your business better. And, and that's kind of, kind of the goal, you know, for me, I'm, I'm always interested in, in anything that can make my life better, whether it's something very simple or it's some drastic change. You know, I really like to think long thoughts about those type of things and, and then do my absolute best to, to execute on them. So I think that's different for, for every person. And, you know, obviously it requires willpower to execute on the stuff you learn. Um, but what's useful is just, you know, knowing that your goal when you consume content is to take something away from it that you can actually implement in your own life. And, uh, I've, I've kind of tried to do that, you know, in the, in the company here, I've I've put together a worldwide cyclery reading program. So, so all the employees here actually get $20 an hour to, to read a book. And that, that time is based off of the audiobook time. And, and it ha- there's a couple caveats. The first one is it has to be recommended or approved by me. And when they're done with the book, they have to you know send me a little book report and an email about what they thought of the book. And then three things they're going to pull away from the book that they're going to implement into their own life. And I've, I've put that in place here to kind of inspire people to read and enjoy it. And uh, uh, it's been going now for about six months. And it's working 
pretty well. I mean, I, I thought it would work a little better since I thought the in, the cash incentive was pretty good. But um, a lot of the guys here are not, you know, they're not money hungry. It's not the finance industry, so they don't care as much about that. But they, you know, a lot of them are are reading books and and I love watching, you know, the the guys here. I mean, anybody learn something and and put it into use in their own life, and the, that's inspiring to me. But yeah, I mean, just just trying to sum up what you learn and then just be diligent about actually using that knowledge. That that's huge. Super important. Awesome. I think that's great closing advice. Uh, thanks so much again for your time, Jeff. So WorldwideCyclery.com, again, is the website, is the store. I also have a retail store you guys can check out. Uh, I think you can find that on the worldwide, WorldwideCyclery.com. Anyone else you recommend listeners go and check out if they want to follow along with what you're up to? Yeah, you know, uh, our Instagram's pretty cool. It's obviously pretty tailored to a bunch of high-end bikes and, and fancy stuff there. Um, you know, I'm on Facebook as well. Jeff Cayley, J E F F last name C A Y L E Y. Uh, I honestly don't personally partake in, in Twitter or Instagram or much Facebook at all myself. Um, I, our company does and cares about that, but I don't know. It's, it's not a big thing for me, but if anyone does want to connect with me, I am on Facebook and, uh, you know, always love chatting e-commerce and business. Awesome. Thanks again for your time, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. Appreciate it. Here's a sneak peek of what's in store for the next Shopify Masters episode. People aren't necessarily going to eBay to search for, you know, a niche product unless it's a, it's a gift or, you know, they're really intent on finding this product. So usually, you know, we're usually the first ones to even get to the market by showing this in the newsfeed. And some of these people have never even seen some of these products before. And that's usually our first, um, you know, our first golden nugget right there is that, you know, showing this products first before they can actually search on Amazon or eBay or AliExpress, it gives, gives us a head start to the market. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.